session is entitled Bring You Around Frontend, the case for a headless CMS. The term CMS, headless CMS and decoupled CMS will be used interchangeably, even if technically this is something uh, different. The presentation will be given by myself, Thierry Lewilly. I'm the web program coordinator at CTA and BAPS, web architect at the digital agency Brixen. Uh, what is the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation? Well, we have a mission, which is a mouthful. It's to advance food security, resilience, and inclusive economic growth in Africa, the, Car the Caribbean, and the Pacific through innovations in sustainable agriculture. And we fund it by the EU almost entirely. Question is, why is CTA as a technical center involved in web development at all? Historically, CTA was mainly building capacity in those regions, so in the, in the uh, Caribbean, the Pacific, and the African regions. And they did that through organi the organization of workshops and by uh, distributing printed publications. For almost 30 years, uh, the CTA was, uh, fun was um, started in 1984. For almost 30 years, we were a kind of a publishing house. We have somewhat 600 titles in our catalog, in English, in French, in Portuguese, in Swahili. And we still have a kind of e-commerce website uh, called publishingcta.int that we use to, distrib to distribute these books. We don't sell them, but it's a kind of credit system and everybody who is eligible can just order those books and get them shipped uh, everywhere in the world. But shipping physical books uh, around the globe is extremely expensive and also is limited in terms of impact. In 2004, we started shifting this whole information sharing um, um, effort and, 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 and work through the web. So uh, the web became the way we got that information to our users. But every project hired its own web, develop web developer or web designer and depending on their preference, we ended up with uh, a WordPress, uh, Easy Publish, a Drupal, a Joomla site, you name it. The result was a big mess. Uh, we had in 2012, 118 websites built on different CMSs, on different platforms, different SLAs, um, with an in inconsistent navigation and a huge maintenance cost. The maintenance was poor or simply non-existing, so security updates were not done and um, often projects were left alone or sites were left alone when the project stopped. In 2013, we started moving from Easy Publish, which was the, the main, the big sites we had were at that moment on Easy Publish. We started moving them to Joomla. Easy Publish at the time was reinventing itself and was rewriting the whole code base based on Symfony. Uh, moving to the new Easy Publish was at that time not an option. The new Easy Publish was simply not there. And also it was like starting a new project from scratch. So uh, since I was most familiar with Joomla, uh, Joomla was for me the obvious choice and the obvious way to go. Also, I had met some nice developers at the Joomla days in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, CTA is based in the Netherlands, in Wageningen. And um, we started on a journey to move to have this migration project from Easy Publish to Joomla. Some of our sites, we had a couple of Joomla 1.5 sites, we couldn't move them at all because the, the core of Joomla was so heavily customized that simply updating or upgrading was not an option anymore. But what we had, because we took a long time, this is 2016, we started in 2013, in those three years, we had Joomla 166, 17, 25, 304, 316, 327 and 365 websites. We still had 40 sites, not 118, but still 40. And we had the same custom components built for different Joomla versions. We had the same content fragmentation and we have heavily frustrated content managers blaming Joomla for everything you can imagine and starting their own WordPress websites. We also added to the development a bit of Noku, which was maybe not so smart because it added to the complexity of our Joomla installs which led to refactoring and more refactoring and each step in the right direction also meant two steps in the, in the opposite direction. The problem was that 
all the work we did on the code and on the infrastructure wasn't visible for the end user or for the content managers. It's a bit like working on the railway system. Uh, all, the, all the hard work which is done to have those trains running smoothly is something that's completely invisible for the end user unless something happens and then the technology suddenly becomes in a very negative way very visible. So it's only when things goes wrong that, that actually the work that was done was, was visible. We also started on code automation and, and pipeline uh, and code versioning and also on that level a huge work was done to get the deployment pipeline set up in a correct way. Having a proper staging, a preview and a production environment was all work that took a lot of resources, time and energy. And even if all that visible, invisible work done, we still had different implementations of modules and components and the reuse of components, which was what we well, the, the kind of marketing speak we had in the beginning was simply almost impossible. We still uh, we couldn't do it without pre-writing big parts of the code and uh, in the line we had regression and we had conflicts all the time. It resulted by bypassing com contents completely so and even more custom development which ultimately led to uh, completely user unfriendly or unuser friendly and incomprehensible UI. The backend was just something that content managers started to refusing to use. And the worst example I had of this is that they started using an expression engine or a WordPress site, which through the iframe button or the custom HTML, they loaded inside the module or inside the body of the Joomla content, which was completely crazy. So the whole development came finally to this kind of situation. Nothing was moving forward anymore. And we had to find a way out of this, this kind of mess. And our two biggest problems that we had set out to solve in the beginning were still there. We still had content fragmentation, not as much as we had in the beginning, but still tremendously, 40 websites still. We still had unstructured data. And there was something else that happened, is a fragmented audience. In the meantime, our audience was moving in those Pacific, Caribbean, and African regions massively to mobile. We were still developing for the desktop. Mobile is a huge opportunity, but it's also a huge mess. This is the number of devices connecting to a website in one single month of time, somewhere in 2016. So the question is, how can we deal, or how can we deal with not having control over the size of somebody's screens, of the, the, the way they, they input something uh, on the, the, the layout that they have. So it was on, on a side note, something else. This is data from 2018 from Uganda. We did a data survey from 50,000 farmers, 56,000 farmers. And you see that 52% of those 50,000 don't even have a phone. And then if you look what kind of phone they have, 18.9% has a smartphone. The big majority, 80.1, has a feature phone. We also asked what they use their phone for in the last three months. Well, obviously, they use it for what the phone was built, to call and to have voice messages, a little bit of SMS and internet. is really a really tiny part of what they use their phone for. So it's a bit double. You see that we have massive demand and, and growth of mobile consumption from our content. But at the same time, we know that some of our end users are simply not having access. First part of the solution is separation of content and form. We had to separate the content from its form so it could adapt to all those different contexts and constraints, to the different platforms and devices. So, built an API first and just stole it from the, the main hall. How do we do it? First of all, the first thing you have to do, you have to start defining your content model. That's always the first thing. Uh, we tried to be smart and we went to schema.org definitions by, by the big uh, players in the industry. And you modeled whatever you had, events, articles, persons, organization, channels, and so on, using the schema definitions from, uh, uh, from, from the schema.org site. On top of the API, we built a couple of web apps. The web apps is just a way of having a content, of manipulating content in the API, events, an article manager, an organization manager, and a people manager. The event manager was the first thing that we delivered. And the nice thing was, since it's an API, it can, it can talk to everything 
which also has an API. So we have integration with Outlook, which wasn't easy, but was feasible. Uh, RSS readers, MailChimp, spreadsheet software, BI tools, Eventbrite. And basically, um, this, this API-oriented approach to content management provides structured content via that cloud-based API and enables us to synchronize editorial decisions across the different platforms. It's really important to know that this is a channel-based system. So it's it just like the BBC, you have a sports, you have a news channel and so on. You build it the same kind of, of business logic behind it. You can configure in the API channels. Channels are nothing else than filter queries on the database. And you're referencing to, to big databases like the Agrivoc database is a database of 30,000 agriculture concepts. So what is happening is that if you ingest content in that API, immediately you reference to the database. We do the same with the GeoName, GeoDB, the Geo, uh, GeoNames database, and it will find noun entities in your text. So if there's an agriculture concept in that text, it will immediately list it. It's like semi-automated tagging of, of the text. The same with geolocation. If there's a country or a city or so, something, which is a GeoName in the text, it will automatically find that, uh, that in, in your content. Based on those, you can have channels based on concepts and this is this can be a concept this is not a concept agribusiness incubation but you could have a channel based on a country since we also have persons in the system you could have a channel saying i want a channel with all the events that a certain person one of the person our boss uh, has been attending or has been speaking uh, on, on behalf of cta so the SCR is only used, we call it the SCR, the Shared Content Repository, is only used to manage and deliver pure content. And the channel-specific client decides about the visual rep representation of that content. So in that sense, it fits perfectly the definition of what is a headless CMS. It's future-proof in terms of content because the content is flexible and it's dynamic. It's also not locked to a particular CMS. It's not tied to what it looks like, it's tied to what it means. And separating the data and the presentation has actually been the developer best practice since ages, since the MVC model. That was already one of the basic ideas that we had. So the headless approach allows developers to build clients using their own favorite tools. They can pick whatever they are used to, 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 to use to, to build those clients. The client connects to the headless API, fetches the content it needs, and takes care of the presentation, just like the, the view and the controller part would do locally. Having raw structured data, uh, JSON, data in JSON format is a nice thing to have, um, made available by the API. But we still needed a front-end delivery system, something to get that JSON data into a front-end web application. And that's a lot of teamwork. And if you don't have front-end <coughs> developers in your team, you will need something extra. You will need something to enable content managers to quickly change and, and, and build new landing pages. This is anyhow challenging in, in, a, in a headless uh, setup. Dealing with presentation of data in different channels, in different clients, introduces a minefield of challenges. For each new client and device, the developer must handle a range of issues. To name a few, link handling, formatting, caching and lazy loading, permissions, error handling, they can all be specific to the client. This is why we needed to build something that gets the content directly from the API and real-time manages the presentation layer using pre-built horizontally, horizontally stackable containers. And to build a front-end, we looked at what The Guardian has been doing, uh, on, with, uh, and it's by Information Architects from Switzerland, it's containerist. Is the container model. And um, this modular, modular system of content allows us to implement responsive designs because the containers are responsive in, them, in themselves, while also re retaining a kind of story hierarchy. Each of the items contains a, a set of stories which are put together into slices, which are then co com being combined to make containers. This set of stories are the outputs of a specific content channel. As we said, it can be an event or an article channel, and the channels are configurable in the API and are basically filtered content queries. So we ended up with having three concepts, the API, 
the front-end tools with the container-based model, and then there was something that we still needed to build, was something that could bridge between those two. And That's where I, I'm coming. You're coming in? <laughs> Yeah, so this is a two-speaker session. Uh, yeah, so um, Jerry mentioned earlier that uh, uh, he had come into contact with uh, a bunch of nice uh, uh, Joomla developers in Holland. Um, I was one of the later ones actually to, to encounter Thierry. Um, and he actually approached us uh, with the question, could we build him the UI? Because, as uh, he explained, they had already set out to commission this custom uh, content repository, this, this, this content managing system, uh, and were now looking for somebody to deliver them a front end. Um, so we were happy to oblige, and we set, set up on this very interesting journey. Um, of course, we started this project like we did any other project. We just started by defining the digital strategy. Uh, we conducted research, gathered insights, and then based upon those insights, uh, we created our, our plan. Um, we also established a preliminary route along which uh, we thought we were going to be implementing the project eventually on a technical uh, uh, level. Um, so, um, you know, then we started doing the wireframes. Uh, we did a, 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 a wireframe prototype of it. Uh, we identified the interactions. Uh, we started working on the information architecture uh, um, uh, that would allow us, you know, to, to make use of the schema.org uh, tag data inside of the content repository and also make use of all uh, the, uh, the geo tagging and uh, um, uh, the, 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 the Agrivoc, thank you, the Agrivoc ta tagging that was being done in the, um, in the content repository because we wanted to make optimal use of it. Uh, and one of the big problems we needed to bridge uh, was the fragmentation of, of content, uh, not only in terms of demographics, but also in terms of how the user uh, was actually navigating through all these 40 websites that still exist in CTA, uh, getting from one piece of content to the other, or rather, they were not able to get from one piece of content to the other. So that was one of the really major things we started to resolve by means of information architecture. Of course, um, that took a lot of talk and a lot of planning and a lot of more talk uh, until we finally felt that we had formulated the correct uh, a solution based on those wireframes that we did. So we set out to design the real user interfaces. Uh, we started creating uh, uh, mockups, uh, static mockups, but it also uh, we created uh, mockups using Envision uh, uh, that were uh, more interactive. And we started creating all these different uh, components that you can actually see um, uh, on these on these prints. And we started categorizing them. Um, actually, we started categorizing them for use inside of a design. Uh, uh, a design guide and not with, with no inclination of what we're going to use them for later. Uh, so we started doing that and eventually we ended up with a complete system uh, of containers that could be stacked to form uh, story-based messages uh, uh, that were to be delivered on web pages in some web uh, in some website. So we were ready to create the website but um, the planning uh, was made uh, beforehand and that determined delivery of the front end before we actually had a page building tool in place. So we needed to get very creative um, because one of the issues that CTA encountered was that of very angry uh, uh, content editors or website managers that actually did no longer want to work with the tools they had uh, at hand. Um, there was this camp that wanted to do Joomla, there was another camp that wanted to do WordPress, uh, then there was this whole new content uh, uh, managing system um, that was actually able to take over the entire content management from, from, from any system. Uh, but CTA internally was also not completely convinced that that was maybe actually the right way to do. Um, so we came up with another system. We said, okay, um, we have 
uh, we have content. It's coming from the content uh, uh, repository. Uh, we had at this point already created all of the HTML and all of the CSS for the designs uh, uh, that were done. Um, so all we needed was putting it into templates, but no Joomla, no WordPress. So where were we going to put them? And especially how would we do it without having uh, a system to manage all this? So what we did is we uh, devised a JSON-based system um, whereby essentially each page uh, was going to be a JSON configuration um, and it would consist of nested components. The page, you, you can look at the page as, as itself as being one component and that one component would have nested other components and each of these components uh, would then uh, 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 refer to one of those blocks that you saw earlier on those, on those designs, on those mockups. And then one step further, these containers could also contain other containers, whereby you could create a large container that, that is responsive in itself and that, create, that could have one channel, four, uh, four channels, each of them being one column, each of them calling in from the uh, API another set of data. Um, and we, we envisioned this um, in a way that, A, it would be very easy to get content in from any source because technically we wouldn't only have to get content from the custom permissioned uh, content repository, but we could in fact also get it from Joomla or from WordPress or from Magento or from whatever. So, um, and then the other thing was, uh, essentially we created these by hand. It was a painful job, I can tell you that. Um, but the vision was that we would, after this had been delivered, create a system uh, that would be able to create these JSON instructions for us in a more visual user interface. So um, to, to kind of illustrate to you the concept of, of what this thing is that, that we uh, created, um, I created uh, a, few, a few illustrations. So we started out by, by uh, already we had designed the components, but we started um, defining them in JSON, each of these ones individually. And um, we put those inside of one big box, so to speak. So this became like our little library of components. And we could now use these components to drag them onto a page, create new pages, um, and if at some point uh, a container was missing, we could just create a new one, place it on the, on the, uh, on the system and, and done. And each of these containers could then be configured to talk to an API. And <coughs> this is very powerful because it could also mean, and imagine just what you could do with this, is that each of these containers on a single web page would never just have to be made out of content of a single source. The top container could be a video from YouTube. And these containers could be articles from wherever, WordPress, uh, uh, Joomla. And we realized when we were doing this that we had solved another big problem, namely the CMS war, because we imagine, I mean, we, we work for, for small, large clients. Um, and Basically, whenever you, whenever you go there and you start a new project, um, you usually tell them that they need to update their Joomla or maybe uh, migrate to a completely different system because that's what your company is, is familiar with, with working in, in the technology stack. Um, or the other way around, the company comes to you and says, yeah, you know, but we created this custom Drupal system and we want that to use to keep on using that. Um, with a system like this, if you, if you work API first, you don't have that problem anymore. Everybody can just work with the tool that they're most accustomed to and, and enjoy and, and maybe invested a lot of time and money and effort in, into learning because usually larger companies, they have a staff, they have spent a lot of time and money towards uh, the systems they're already using. Plus, uh, there is content that usually doesn't live in, for instance, Joomla. You, maybe you have a, a CRM uh, application or, or you have customer data, whatever, somewhere else and you want to bring it into your front end, that's usually a major issue. That usually involves a lot of custom development, ergo a lot of money. 
So um, this, this is what we envisioned this would be. And um, what I will show you next um, is basically the proof of concept of the first, first version we, we, um, uh, we ever released. Now, what just happened went very quickly. Um, I'm not trusting uh, the, the technical circumstances of the conference enough to do a live demo, but if you are interested to see one, come look me up and I'll be glad to give you one in person. But essentially what we did in this version is, is we, had a, we had a list on the right hand side here and we had um, the page on the left hand side there. And remember when we said that we needed to have a tool uh, that was more pleasing to uh, the content managers. They wanted in fact to be able to create their pages and preview them in the way that they were actually going to look once they were published on the web. Now, it's, it's kind of possible with Joomla, you could create some, some secret content URLs in which you can preview your content. In WordPress, it works a little bit differently where you have this previewing system and it's a little bit more like what you see is what you get. <coughs> but none of them are really what you see is what you get. And we really wanted to have something uh, that would allow them to fabricate pages, especially landing pages, because this is one of the uh, requirements for CTA, uh, that they do a lot of different projects. Um, and they need to have a lot of one-off uh, website initiatives. So they needed something whereby, whereby they could just create a landing page really quick and then publish it and preview it. Well, and this is not possible. So you have your page there. This is actually uh, 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 the, the, the page as it is going to look inside the browser. We're using Electron for that. I don't know if any of you have ever used it, uh, but Electron has this really cool uh, feature called WebView. Um, and it allowed us to do this. Uh, so you select a container from here, uh, key aspect here, the containers that you see, they're actually wired up uh, from the API. So they're getting the content straight from the API. So what you're previewing here already is your own content. You drag that thing over on your page, you save it, you publish it, boom, done. Um, so that was our proof of concept done. Huh? Um, so we're now actually in the process of um, evolving this system and creating the new version. Um, so I'm going to give you uh, a bit of a sneak preview actually uh, of, of Frontender 1.0 because this was 0. Point something. Um, so like I said earlier, um, one of the things we're solving is the CMS war because you no longer need one. Everybody can use uh, their own favorite CMS. Uh, we're as a company, as an agency, are still using Joomla on a number of projects. Uh, these projects are largely custom uh, component type development work. Um, we also do work for uh, platforms in WordPress. We do some Magento stuff. Uh, I've never personally done Drupal. Uh, somebody in my company has though. Uh, but we're also talking to APIs like uh, YouTube and Twitter, and I'm sure all of you are doing that. And um, more recently, and this is also because we started developing content, we started using Contentful quite a lot, actually. So um, we are referring to this system as being omni-content. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with omni-channel. Uh, and so now, by accident, we've kind of created only content on the channel. Um, all of this um, is now font under 1.0. Um, and I get asked by people, what is front ender? Um, and there's actually two answers to it. It depends a little bit. Uh, for non-developers, front ender is, is what you see, is what you get, uh, a web page building tool. Um, and you can use front ender without any technical, uh, technical knowledge. Of course, any developer will go, oh yeah, okay, sure, not for me. But uh, Frontender is also a web application development platform. Um, and in fact, Frontender has literally two phases because there is a developer version built into it, but not in any way like in WordPress. I don't know if any of you ever would use WordPress. In the, back in the days in Joomla, we used to edit our templates in our CSS from inside the administrator. Anybody ever done that? So kind of like that, the difference. You did it, yeah. Okay. That was a long time ago, correct. 
I still miss that, though, at some point in 1.5, but anyway. Um, so, uh, trying to explain the content, the concept, um, and, and actually not even, this is, this is more or less the workflow in which you would de develop for front-ender. First, you design and develop your, your containers being your HTML and your CSS, like you, like you would do now. Uh, but then you would make sure that you could get content from some API. So you install or write uh, uh, adapters. And so you would have an adapter for Joomla. You would have an adapter for Contentful. You would have an adapter maybe for Magento, maybe for your CRM or the, the custom commissioned content repository <laughs> that CTA did. Um, then you would start configuring pages from these containers and link them to that content that you're getting in from those adapters. And then you design your site structure assign routes to your pages and publish them on the, on the internet. Um, now, like any other CMS, you, you, would have, you would expect a couple of features that you need to have. <laughs> Sorry? Which is I just need. Oh, really? <laughs> and it's a trademark, my trademark. Oh, really? Yes. Seriously? Not yeah. you, you, you trademark multi-site? Multi-site is ah. a trademark of my company. Oh, really? <laughs> uh oh, so I'm in trouble now? <laughs> PM. Yeah, 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 as a PM. <laughs> Okay, so multilingual, multi-domain, multi-site, extensible. This is my domain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, use the rules and permissions because for any enterprise uh, installation, you would need to have something like that. Um, and route management, uh, which is important and very convenient if you really have that. And by route management, for instance, I mean if you create a page uh, by dragging those containers onto a page and publishing it. Uh, it may live somewhere in your system on some slash, some slash, some mypage.html. Um, but with Frontender, you could create a, a, a campaign page for that, maybe on a subdomain or on a specific URL, and it would still live inside your, in, inside your ecosystem here, but it would just be accessible on another route too. And Frontender, the front end of it will actually uh, uh, control uh, the correct way in which those pages will be re redirected so, so, so Google knows and will be happy with you. Um, so this is what the system um, is now looking like. This is actually what we're developing right now. Uh, the first uh, proof of concept we did was based on material designs uh, interface. Uh, which was great because we were able to develop quickly and try some things and, and you know, uh, um, get acquainted with it and seeing and investigating how the client was actually using it and maybe what was lacking and so on and so on. Um, so since we have, uh, we have redesigned this, what we're looking, here, uh, looking at here is a collection of pages belonging to this website, brixton.nl. Um, you can see that each page is represented by a thumbnail of the actual page from the time it was saved. Um, there's a bunch of other information about it, whether or not it's, uh, uh, it's published. Uh, the, the page on the left there has this little home, so that's the, the home icon or the root page, as we call it, which is something that's configurable, a little like uh, the, 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 the main item ID uh, uh, for, for, of Joomla. There you can control your routes, uh, control your cache from the front end, um, this is uh, an implementation of uh, the, the, the settings for the site. What you saw here is that the site is available uh, apparently in Dutch because there, there is this Dutch flag all the way on the top. Uh, this is something that you would manage here. In this case, two versions, two, two languages for this site have been, uh, uh, have been assigned. Uh, I could, if I wanted to, assign en.brixen.nl, for example, if I wanted to map that to the English locale. Um, and I could also have, like I explained earlier, the proxy domains, and maybe I wanted our projects to live on cases.brixen.nl. Um, this is what the actual page, the editing of the page would look like. Um, we have trimmed down the interface as much as we can. Uh, we're currently looking into uh, whether or not it would be possible to, once you start editing your page, uh, to, to you know, maybe temporarily hide the, uh, the, the menu bar so you have even more space <coughs> available to edit your page. Um, you have your, your, your saving, uh, uh, your publishing, your, uh, everything there. Uh, on the code view icon there, uh, which I think I have here too, um, yeah, this, this will produce this page. 
so here you are able to, to edit your, uh, your configuration, your page configuration directly, uh, which can be really handy. Um, this, uh, these are the page settings, not so interesting. What's more interesting is this view. This, we will have, uh, we will be implementing revision, uh, versioning, revisions uh, of a page. Um, in this particular case, what you're looking at is, uh, you're looking at the currently, be, the, the current uh, uh, revision of the page that's being edited here. And then one step before that, yesterday at uh, 9.48, that's the revision of the page that was published. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, the revision that you're looking at now. Um, I could publish this revision and then that one would become the revision uh, uh, version, so the eye would move, move one row up. Um, then once you start editing the page, before we had, if you can remember on the right hand side, this list of containers on the left hand side, a smaller version of your page. Uh, here we have gathered the containers inside a movable window, which is really convenient if you're a power user and you have two monitors. You can just drag that over to one side and then put it in the other, in the other monitor to, uh, to build out your page. A little bit more information. We have drag and drop, which is really fancy, you know, and if you start selling your product, ah, you drag and drop your containers, but it's really not so convenient. I don't really like it. Um, you know, it's cumbersome, you have to move your mouse from right to left or whatever. So uh, we decided to, to drop that function instead, just click, I want this one insert, boom, done with it. Um, then I explained earlier the concept of these nested containers. So um, once you right click on a container, this, this for instance, this is one container, it goes onto here, here there's another container starting. You can actually see this website on Brixton.nl if you want to figure out how this whole container setup uh, really works. Um, and when you do, you get this little interface here, and when you hover the mouse, uh, each of these rows will highlight, and then the corresponding subcontainer will also highlight, so you know that that's actually the one that you're going to be editing. And then you'll get a similar window to the one with the container that you saw before. In this case, it gives you all the controls uh, uh, for, uh, for your container. This, uh, this is actually the exciting bit. I mean, this looks boring, I understand it's a form. But actually what happens is this top thing here, the adapter, that's what connects you to the API. In this case, this particular implementation is against Contentful. So if I would click on that little link icon, it would open a second interface, and this interface would interface with my content on Contentful directly. And I would get a list of articles, I can just select whatever article I want to put in there, and does anybody know Contentful? Okay, so, <laughs> so um, in Contentful you create your own, you define your own content models. Um, and we have a content model that's called Plug, um, and essentially I'm using it to plug in content. Um, so this would, uh, well actually it says section there, but in reality this is a plug. Um, I select that plug from uh, my uh, contentful uh, uh, list. Um, and the way we've set this one up is that even though that gives me a piece of data, um, I can actually override the content from contentful because um, if you are referencing an article in several pages in your, in your website system, it gets a little boring if it's the same introduction text and the same title and the same, you know, over and over again. And sometimes within the context of the page, you want to overwrite that and you want to say something relating to the content you're currently reading and oh, and by the way, we have this other article and you really need to check that out. So you want to overwrite that, that, that introduction text. So that's how we set this up. And this is actually another interesting feature and I don't know if I'm running out of time very quickly, but um, uh, um, if, if you build a system with front end and with all these containers, you can create containers in exactly the way that you want. So containers being the physical form, the physical presentation of your content. Um, and depending on what your client needs or, or what your domain is or whatever you want to achieve, you can really customize those little bits and pieces of your interface uh, uh, to match exactly the story that you want to convey. Uh, so this is what we needed to, to have here. So essentially I'm getting my content from Contentful. I'm overriding it because I want to, uh, and, and the other one, the stand first, 
it's okay, I'm not bothering with it. It's, it's, that, it's there, it looks like a placeholder text, but actually it's my text from content, so I'm not changing it. Um, so just one question. Yeah, sure. The override is stored locally, or it's pushed back to something? It's stored inside of the configuration in this particular case. Oh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, the, the API goes two ways. You could also, if you wanted to, okay. you know. So when you are editing here, you're really editing the local copy in this example? Uh, yeah, yeah, but not a copy of the, con the Contentful copy, article yeah, yeah, lives right. where, where it lives in Contentful. It's yeah. just I'm overriding a piece of text and that goes right. into the configuration. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Um, so to go quickly, we've since done a few implementations. Uh, uh, this one is also against Contentful, which is the Brixton website. This one is for CTA again. It's their annual report, um, uh, which the lovely Chiara, he designed for us. Um, and... Um, oh yeah, API, so Joomla is not really doing this yet. I'm hoping they will. Uh, but there are a few private initiatives to create an API so that, can you, so that you can use Joomla uh, in this way. One of the initiatives is by the Dutch Joomla developers uh, um, and the other one uh, is by Parth, oh, and, and by you also. Um, so they, I'm sure there's a report, is your, is your project Public? It's on, it's on GitHub. Okay, so it's on GitHub. This one is on GitHub too. It's on Yerio's site. If you want to have a link to it, I can I can give it to you. Um, yeah, and that's all we have time for, I guess. I had this other, I thought maybe we had a long discussion about this concept, but can we, uh, we have time for questions, so. So is this, uh, this front end of EPL, I mean, how are you licensing it? Uh, it's not open source. Uh, we may, we may not. Uh, we're still developing it. Currently, we're just using it for uh, client implementations, like uh, like for CTA. Um, and there's a number of ways uh, we we could uh, we could take this. We're thinking about a SaaS. Uh, we could also do it on a, on a per uh, per installation basis. We currently don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. It's created on a computer. Oh, the stack is okay. Uh, it's created on Symphony actually, and we're using Slim Framework. Uh, we're also using Twig uh, and JSON, and that's basically it. So it's silly simple. And is it Symphony three or four? Uh, it's the latest version. Is that four? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but you're creating uh, like for each page you use uh, Dragon Drop now. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, I can, I can imagine a news overview page, but do you, if you publish news articles, can you set up one kind of default template for each yeah. global news article? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you don't have to create for each article? Yeah, and yeah, exactly, exactly. That's exactly how it works. It's basically, that's a container as well. Yeah. And you can con contain, you can create one container for an entire page, or you can create one container, container for a list. Mm -hmm. The way we implement dynamic article pages usually is uh, we would create a, a, a header, uh, a body and maybe a footer or some uh, some author information or whatever and we compose those into a combi in a combined container <laughs> and that would then be your page and that lives as a as a sort of a, a blueprint uh, and gets called by the adapter by uh, for yeah. Joomla and an article to the article page and it would route that to the user yeah and yeah. Then the, the router has been known by uh, set up of your router of the content yeah yeah exactly exactly and it's interesting because you can treat a page, and, and that's one of the things we wanted to achieve. Um, right now, if you're doing any templated-based CMS, uh, if, if you create, you, you create like this template for uh, an article, and then it gets used and used and used and used, and it gets boring. And really, what you sometimes want is you want to inject this little extra module, or you want to inject, I don't know, a video, whatever, and it's not possible because you know the template is very static in that way, and it just accepts a, a particular kind of data set. Uh, but with this, <coughs> you could actually open up that uh, template and, and drag in another container, and then your page is different, and you can save that page on, other, on another uh, uh, URL, or create the template, uh, or, or revise the template for all the other uh, uh, dynamic pages to use from that moment on as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So we also have contextual containers which are filled in depending on the context in which they are put. So it means that those contextual containers can have related articles. So it means that even if new content is added, it's always the, the best match for that article, not yeah. what the content manager has decided at some point of time. 
that was the best you can get out of it. So do you also define a primary campaign on this page in order to get the content? No. So oh, yeah, yeah, th uh, yeah. The page itself is also a container. Okay. Uh, so the page itself would get or could get a uh, uh, configuration uh, uh, to, you know, for, for which, which uh, um, uh, content resource it, it, it needs to contextualize itself to. Yeah, so I mean, on the pages you showed were landing pages, right? There was collection of, um, of content. That's, that's, that's the coincidence of what I, what, what I showed, yeah. But in fact, for the dynamic pages, uh, for instance, that article page, uh, uh, well, of course, the, the, the article ID would get injected by the request, uh, and it would then be handled by the by the by the top level container, which in that case would be the page, and it would then know what to do, and it, it would then make uh, the call to the API, because l every container has or can have doesn't necessarily. I mean, you can have a bunch of containers that have static content, but the way it generally works is that each container has some link to some uh, uh, some API. So it will get its own data. So you could have, I mean, you could have an article uh, fetching its own data, but there could be another container that based upon the fact that it's inside an article container that has this API lookup could decide to do something else with maybe another API or maybe decides to do another uh, uh, search request on the API to, to, to fetch uh, a bunch of, I don't know, videos, photos, yeah. whatever.